in this lesson in our series of studies, I would like to deviate from the direction that we have been going and look at some of the individuals who contributed in the early days of the concept to restore New Testament Christianity. Of course, history records that the seed of the Restoration Movement, uh, the roots of the Restoration Movement, are to be found in Scotland under the leadership of uh, John Glass and his son-in-law, Robert Sandeman, a group broke away from the Church of Scotland and established independent churches uh, in uh, Glasgow and uh, in Edinburgh. And they resolved to return to the New Testament pattern and did so as best they could. But their movement uh, bogged down along the way and uh, uh, met uh, great uh, opposition from uh, not only the government of Scotland, but also from the religious organizations in that land. Uh, then uh, later in Scotland, the Haldane brothers took up the same plea and uh, endeavored to follow it to its logical conclusions and went a little farther than uh, John Glass and uh, Sandeman uh, had gone, but with the combined efforts uh, of the Haldanes and Sandeman and Glass, uh, independent congregations were built uh, in uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow and then uh, spread out into other sections of the nation. But in America, the concept seemed to have uh, given uh, uh, form to uh, itself in the fertile brain and mind and heart of uh, a man named Elias Smith and another named uh, Dr. Abner Jones in the New England states, particularly in New Hampshire and Vermont. And they too followed this same concept of establishing independent congregations, and many of them were called Churches of Christ. And the individuals were required to obey the gospel to be added to these congregations, uh, even by the Lord or by those who presided over them. Later, this organization uh, uh, finally merged into what it called the Christian Connection and then joined forces with the Congregational Church of uh, the Northeast and uh, finally uh, lost its identity as a restoration movement altogether. About the same time, down in uh, North Carolina and Virginia, a group uh, led by James uh, O'Leary uh, and uh, David uh, Haggard and Rice Haggard uh, and Clement O'Nance and uh, some others uh, broke away from the newly established uh, Methodist Church and formed uh, what they call the, uh, the uh, Republican Methodist group and then eventually took the Bible as their rule of faith and practice and called themselves the Christians. This group later merged with the New England group and uh, became a part of the denominational movement of the Congregational Church and eventually uh, merged with the United uh, uh, Church of Christ. But the, the real significant and uh, lasting and moving influence uh, on the western frontier uh, was led by uh, Barton Warren Stone in Kentucky, Thomas Campbell in Pennsylvania and his son Alexander Campbell, and uh, Walter Scott who came to Pennsylvania soon after the Campbells had uh, started the movement. And when in our history we study the leaders of the movement, we always get back to what we call the Stone-Campbell movement because of the great influence originally that Stone and Campbell exerted upon this effort and later joined by other individuals. Now I would hasten to add at this point in time 
that no one today who knows the facts of the case claim that these men founded the Church of Christ, founded New Testament Christianity, founded the gospel of our Lord, or founded the system that Jesus Christ and the apostles established. That was established beginning on the day of Pentecost and enlarged upon and perfected during the first century in which the Bible was being written. These individuals have merely set their hands to the task of bringing back into existence the Church of Christ, which had lost its identity and had merged itself into denominationalism or had lost its faith and had become atheistic and agnostic as they dealt with the problems on the uh, western frontier. Now, Barton Warren Stone was born in Tobacco, Tobacco, Maryland on December 23, 17 and 72. He grew up in a large family. His father did not seem to be too religious, but his mother was a strong, uh, had a strong commitment to the Episcopal faith. So during the infancies of uh, her children, she had them all sprinkled by an Episcopal priest. But when uh, Stone was three years old, his father died, and his mother took the siblings and moved them to Spotsylvania County in, uh, in Virginia. Now at the age of 18, the estate of the Stone family was divided, and Barton took his part of the estate and went down and enrolled in Guilford Academy, which was operated uh, as a log cabin college under the authority of David Caldwell near Greensboro, North Carolina. Stone did not go there for, because of his religious convictions, but he really went to prepare for the study of law, and he intended to transfer from Guilford when he had finished there to Hamden, Sydney, where he would uh, uh, earn a degree in law. He did not like the religious atmosphere that was there, and uh, like the, uh, the uh, preachers who were preparing for the ministry uh, less. But uh, the day on which he intended to leave uh, the Guilford Academy and go to Sydney Hamden, uh, that night it came a great storm and uh, almost a deluge and flooded the whole territory and rained all the next day and prohibited uh, anybody from leaving their quarters. Stone took this under his Calvinistic conviction as an omen of God that God did not want him to study law and he wanted him to remain in the Caldwell Academy and uh, become a minister. Well, he did so, and under the guidance of David Caldwell, he prepared himself for uh, the licensing process with the Orange Presbytery. And so after graduation from the academy, he applied to the Orange Presbytery for licensure. He took the examination, but it required six months for the presbytery, presbytery to report on the results of the examination. And he decided that he would go to Georgia and visit one of his uh, uh, other brothers uh, down there. And while he was in Georgia, he got a job teaching at, the, uh, at a, an academy in uh, 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 Washington, Georgia, called the Succoth Academy. And there he stayed and taught for a year. During that time, he came in contact with an individual who was named Hope Hall, who was the principal of that academy. And he was a strong advocate of the movement led by James O'Kelly and uh, Rice Haggard and Clement Nance uh, in uh, North Carolina. And... Uh, Stone went with Hall on some of his preaching tours as he rode the circuit in that area and became acquainted with the concept of changing the way that uh, religionists had uh, performed and the administration of the organizations with which they were identif identified. Then he returned after a year to North Carolina 
and he preached uh, among the, uh, uh, well, the more disadvantaged uh, economically parts of North Carolina, especially among the Cherokee Indians. And he had very little success in his efforts, and he decided that he would just give up the ministry and, uh, and go to Florida. I don't know why he wanted to go to Florida, but he thought that was virgin territory and a land unexplored and a territory of great opportunity, so he decided he'd go to Florida. But uh, one Sunday in his journey, he stopped at a little rural congregation to worship, and uh, he saw a woman there whom he had known before, and he referred to as a little old lady. And uh, she asked him where he was going, and he told her, and she accused him of being a Jonah and forsaking the responsibilities that he had to preach. And she persuaded him to uh, direct his uh, travels toward uh, uh, Appalachia and Tennessee and uh, eventually in uh, Kentucky. Now, he reached uh, Cane Ridge in uh, Kentucky in the fall of 1796 and was appointed by the Transylvania Presbytery as what they called a supply pastor at Cane Ridge and, uh, and at Concord. There was a vacancy there at the time, and he was appointed to fill that vacancy. He had not been ordained, so by 1798, the Transylvania Presbytery and the Kentucky Synod decided that he must be uh, ordained, and so the uh, examination and the ordination ceremony was conducted by Robert Marshall and James Bly, who were the outstanding leaders within the Presbyterian ranks in the state of Kentucky. Now, following his uh, ordination in 18 and 1, Stone went to Logan County, as I referred to earlier, to hear James McGreedy preach. And on his return to Cane Ridge, Stone used... Uh, for his text, the commission that Jesus Christ gave to his apostles as recorded in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 that reads, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Now Stone reported that he saw in that text two things. One, the universality of the gospel. You did not preach the gospel just to the lost as God had ordained the lost, nor to the redeemed as God had selected the redeemed, but the gospel was to be preached to every man, to every creature, and therefore it had a, a universal appeal to all of the people in all of the world. And the second thing he said he saw in it was that faith is a condition to salvation. You're not ordained without faith. You are not condemned without faith, but you believe the gospel, and as the result of the faith you have in Jesus Christ that you obtain from hearing the gospel or reading the Bible, then you comply with the other conditions of salvation. That's a great uh, uh, period of revolution in the life of Martin Stone that he's gradually coming to the concept of restoring New Testament Christianity. Now during the summer of 18 and 1, Stone went down to Muhlenberg County of Kentucky near Greenville and was married to Elizabeth Campbell on July 2, 18 and 1. He had known the family, no doubt, in Virginia, and he consummated a long courtship by going and, uh, and marrying uh, uh, this young lady, Elizabeth Campbell. They returned to Stone's Farm near Cane Ridge, uh, between Cane Ridge and, and Concord. And by August of 18 and 1, the great Cane Ridge Revival uh, was held. Uh, it was built around the communion service, as we had earlier said, and uh, for about five days in August, uh, the people who had come to Cane Ridge stayed. They came in wagons, in buggies, uh, on horseback, and uh, on foot. And it is said that 25,000 people had gathered, gathered at Old Cane Ridge uh, for that revival. 
uh, there were eight or ten uh, sectarian preachers preaching from various posts uh, on the grounds. And uh, it is reported that some uh, thousand people responded to that preaching and uh, were converted to uh, what they were talking about uh, at that time. Now the revival at Cane Ridge became the starting, the starting point for Stone and his associates to break with the presbytery and the synod and go forth preaching the gospel. Now I must remember that the preaching of the Presbyterian ministers of that day was regulated by what the Westminster Confession of Faith required of them. But here they said, we are going forth with the Bible in our hands, with the gospel in our minds, and we're going to preach that gospel to a lost and dying world. Now there were six Presbyterian preachers and one ruling elder identified with 15 churches, eight of them in Kentucky and seven of them in Ohio, who joined together in this dedicated effort to, to bring about faith in Jesus Christ and obedience to his gospel by uh, preaching the Bible. Those who joined uh, Stone were Richard McNamara, John Dunlavey, Robert Marshall, John Thompson, and David Purvance, who was a ruling elder in the uh, Cane Ridge Church, who later was ordained as a preacher. Now you can imagine when they went forth to preach as they were preaching, that they came in direct conflict uh, with the uh, more orthodox uh, ministers of the faith, and particularly the, the ecclesiastical authorities of the presbytery and the synod. So on September 10 of 18 and 3, they were called before the Kentucky Synod in a meeting at the First Presbyterian Church in Lexington, Kentucky, to answer charges which had been filed against them, and these charges were charges of heresy. They were heretics. They were deviating from the pattern, and they were preaching things that had not been heard and had not been accepted up to this time, and so they were charged with heresy. Now, after a period of hearing and discussion among them and charges and countercharges, the preachers, all 15, all uh, six of them, representing these 15 congregations, uh, were expelled. And the pulpits uh, were declared uh, vacant, and committees were appointed that went to all of these 15 churches and, and notified them that these preachers had been expelled and that their pulpits were vacant and they should seek more orthodox uh, preachers uh, elsewhere. Now what are you going to do in this kind of a situation, the question arose. They had been used to ecclesiastical authority they had been used to associating themselves with presbyteries and synods. And here they now are as individual and independent congregations, responsible to no one so far as a rule of faith and doctrine uh, is concerned. So they decided they would form their own presbytery. Now Stone tried to get the synod to organize uh, a presbytery of these 15 churches and uh, affiliate uh, with the synod, but the synod would have nothing of it. So they decided they would uh, organize an independent one, and they called it the Springfield Presbytery. Now, this represented to them uh, their only system of organization and rule and regulation to which they were responsible. Now by June 24 or June 28 of 18 and 4 the next year, they decided that this body which they had formed was just as sectarian as the ones they had left. And they must uh, release themselves from its obligation and remove it uh, from the category of rule and regulation of their faith. 
So they met on June 28, 18 and 4, and in session at Old Cane Ridge, they wrote what they call the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. Uh, you may not have read uh, that last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery, but you ought to make yourself uh, or make a, get a copy available to you. And it's uh, very easily read. It's not very long. It doesn't have many items. But the real essence of it is that they declared the Springfield Presbytery to have died or passed out of existence, and they wrote its last will and testament. And they willed that the, the principles which they had been advocated would be advocated by these uh, 15 congregations. Now, Barton Stone wrote that these preachers went forth in Kentucky and Ohio and Tennessee and West Virginia and Pennsylvania and some of them into Illinois and Indiana doing what he calls strengthening the churches and constituting new congregations. They went to these places where they had uh, previously preached and where these individuals were still subservient to the Westminster Confession of Faith and tried to strengthen them in the things that they had uh, learned from the Bible. And then they went about organizing other congregations throughout the land. A sad thing happened at this period of time, I think, in the Restoration Movement and was a great deterrent to its uh, progress and it, its expansion. In 1805, the Shakers of New York, under Anne Lee Stanley, heard of the revivals in Kentucky, and uh, she sent uh, three missionaries down uh, to investigate the situation, particularly in Ohio and in Kentucky. And as the result of their persuasive powers, Richard McNamara and John Donlavey and Matthew, and, uh, Matthew Houston left the movement uh, that Stone had begun and joined the Shakers. By 1811, Robert Marshall and John Thompson had become convinced that the Bible was too latitudinarian. You just cannot take the Bible as your creed because it is subject to so many interpretations among us that we need to meet and write our own creed and tell all of the people everywhere the things for which we stand. Well, they met twice. Uh, the idea of a creed was advocated by Marshall and Thompson, and the opposition uh, was led by Barton Stone and David Purvines. And the position of Stone and Purvines uh, uh, prevailed. And so they decided not to write a creed, but to continue to accept the Bible uh, and the Bible alone. Well, this precipitated uh, an effort upon the part of, uh, of Marshall and uh, Thompson to return to the Presbyterians. So in 1811, they went back and uh, ate humble pie and made all of their apologies and confessions to the Synod, which eventually uh, readmitted them uh, to the ministry. However, Barton Warren Stone, Reuben Dooley, and others went forth throughout the land converting those individuals to whom they preached. Stone left Cane Ridge and moved to Goodlitzville, Tennessee in 18 and 12 and lived for two years in the home of his mother-in-law. He thought she was going to give him title to the property as an inheritance upon the part of uh, his wife, uh, but she decided not to do so. So after two years, he returned to Lexington, Kentucky, and organized an academy and founded the old Hill Street uh, Church in 18 and 16. Stone moved to Georgetown in 18 and 19, where he established a congregation and became principal of the old Rittenhouse Academy. Eventually, Stone left Kentucky and moved to Jacksonville, Illinois in 1834. He found two congregations there, one after the Campbell Order and one after the Stone Order, and he refused to preach for either one of them until they united their forces 
and combine their efforts in the same direction of the restoration. They did, and he, he preached for the old Antioch church in Jacksonville, Illinois, until he died. Now, during a meeting which he was conducting near Hannibal, Missouri, he uh, finally wound up at the home of his daughter who lived in Hannibal in uh, 1844, and the illness was fatal, and uh, he died at the home of uh, this daughter. He was buried. Uh, he was taken back to Jacksonville, Illinois, and was buried in the Locust Grove on his farm. Later the farm was sold, and Stone's body was moved from the grove into the cemetery of the Antioch Church, which he had established. And there it stayed until 1847. And in 1847, the Cane Ridge Church of Christ moved the body from Jacksonville to the cemetery of the old Cane Ridge Meeting House and erected a stone, and there the remains of uh, Barton Warren Stone wait the resurrection uh, of the dead. I have facetiously commented on it by saying I don't know what the Lord is going to think when he comes again and where he's going to look for stone whether he's going to the old locust grove or whether he's going to the Antioch Cemetery or whether he will come to the uh, Cane Ridge uh, uh, meeting house. But of course, more seriously, the Lord knows where he is and the Lord will know him when he is raised from the dead. This tombstone is a rather interesting one because on this tombstone it is said that it was erected uh, by the Cane Ridge Church of Christ and that Barton Warren Stone was the distinguished reformer of the 19th century. Well, he was a distinguished reformer, but there were others along with him who distinguished themselves also. Now, the next individual, and many, many people think that the Restoration Movement in America began with the Campbells. It didn't. It began with Stone and his associates because Stone was busy with his efforts in Kentucky long before Campbell left Ireland and came to America. But Thomas Campbell, the father of Alexander, was born on February 1, 1763, in County Down, Ireland. He was a member of the branch of the Scottish Presbyterian Church known as the Seceder Church or the Anti-Burger Church. Following his tenure as a student in Glasgow University, he moved his family to Ahore, Ireland, where he established a congregation and preached and administered an academy which he had founded there. Thomas Campbell was married to Jane Cornegle in June of 1787, whose ancestors were all French Huguenots, and they had some exposure to uh, religious freedom and liberty uh, during uh, the Reformation days in, uh, in France. In 1807, on the advice of his physician, he uh, left Ireland and uh, came to America and finally uh, settled in Washington, Pennsylvania in the southern part of the state. Fortunately, or providentially, uh, when uh, Campbell landed in Philadelphia, the North American uh, uh, Synod was meeting. And uh, Campbell presented his credentials to the uh, Synod, and they assigned him to the Chartier's Presbytery down in uh, western Pennsylvania. He moved there, and uh, the, the uh, Chartier's Presbytery assigned him to four congregations. Washington, Mount Pleasant, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo. And there he took up residency in Washington and became the minister of these four congregations. Now, he had been exposed in uh, Europe not only to the uh, opposition to the uh, uh, Scottish Synod and uh, broke away with the seceders and anti-burgers, but he'd been exposed to the teachings of uh, John Glass and uh, Robert Sandeman and the Haldane brothers in, uh, in uh, Scotland. So he had uh, the, the 
the beginning of a concept that we ought to preach the Bible and the Bible alone. So he went forth with uh, in these congregations in preaching the Bible, preached the truth on the subject of uh, communion as he saw it, and announced publicly that he thought creeds and confessions of faith were no more than human inventions. Well, it didn't take long for him to run afoul with the ecclesiastical authorities of the synod and the presbytery, and they expelled him and declared the pulpits to which he had been assigned vacant. So he proceeded to organize the Christian Association of Washington, into which he gathered all of his associates. He knew it was not a church, but he knew that he had to have some sort of organization, or thought he did, to bring these uh, associates together and keep them all intact. By this time, preaching at the home of Abraham Alters, Thomas Campbell announced his famous motto or his uh, famous saying that has come down among us all. And he said, where the scriptures speak, we will speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we will be silent. Now that's a bombshell in the midst of sectarianism and denominationalism of that day. We will accept the scriptures. Whatever the scriptures say, we will believe and do it. We will not accept anything except what the scriptures teach, and we will honor the silence of the scripture, and we will be silent where they are silent. Now, Con uh, Campbell's followers in the association eventually persuaded him that he should give form to his beliefs and his proposed practices. So in September of 1809, Campbell wrote and published the Declaration and Address. Now this document is to the Campbell Associates just what the last will and testament was to the uh, uh, Barton Warren Stone and his associates. And I need to know, I need to read, I need to learn, I need to get acquainted with both of those documents because they're basic to the concepts and principles and procedures through which they were eventually to go. Now about this time, Alexander, his 20-year-old 20, his son, who had remained in Ireland with uh, his mother and uh, the rest of the family, decided that they would come to America and join the father. Now they started their journey, their sea voyage to America, but unfortunately, they were shipwrecked off the coast of, uh, of uh, uh, Scotland, and there they remained uh, during the, uh, the summer, I mean during the winter. And during the winter, uh, Campbell Alexander enrolled uh, in the, uh, the uh, Glasgow University where his father had uh, formerly uh, been uh, a, uh, a student. Now, Alexander also had been exposed to the teaching of the uh, Restorationist in Scotland before he left there, and was influenced greatly by a man named Greville Ewing. He visited in his home, he heard him preach in one of his tabernacles, and he was deeply impressed with his concept of the interpretation of the Bible and what individuals should do today to restore New Testament Christianity. So when he came to America, he was altogether ready in mind and heart to accept what, Alex, what his father uh, had uh, written in the Declaration and Address. Now at the age of 65, Thomas Campbell made a statement that I want to read with you that I think is basic to the position that he occupied. He wrote, what do we have to do with any question or controversy but to receive the apostles' doctrine as the first believers did and abide in it, asking no questions but what the apostles have stated and answered upon the entire subject of faith and obedience admitting nothing into our churches, either as unto doctrine or practice, or manner of teaching, or terms of communion, 
our ministerial con, uh, qualification, our government. But what we find taught, enjoined and practiced in the primitive churches by apostolic authority and approbation. So when Alexander came to America, he joined his father in this concept. And they went forth to preach the gospel in the territory of Pennsylvania and northern Virginia and in northeastern uh, uh, Ohio. And we'll close there and take up in our next lesson where we have left off here.